One of the most defining features of the Catholic Church is its vast organizational structure, spanning the whole globe. No matter where you go in the world, the same readings and prayers will be celebrated at Mass, the same dogmas taught by the bishops. A statement that is 99% true. There are different rites and local customs within the Church, but let's not go down that road for right now. Because of this near uniformity of liturgy and theology, it can be tempting sometimes to think that there is but one way to approach God and the world from within the Church. This couldn't be further from the truth. Despite being unified under one religion, Catholicism offers a variety of spiritualities, each highlighting particular parts of our faith. What are the most popular spiritualities and what can we learn from them? This is Catholicism in Focus. We begin our survey at the top with the purest and simplest of all spiritualities, Franciscanism, a statement that is at the same time dripping with bias and actually an apt description. The opening line of the rule of St. Francis says it all. The rule in life of the Lesser Brothers is this, to observe the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. While there are 12 chapters to the rule, it is widely held that this line was all that St. Francis wanted, to humbly and simply live as Christ did in the Gospels. For Franciscans, it's all about imitating Christ's earthly life and mission. From the humility of his birth to his care for the poor, his preaching of the reign of God to his passion on the cross, St. Francis was intent on doing exactly as Christ did. For this reason, Franciscans emphasize ministry with the poor, preaching repentance, and joyfully sharing God's love while living simply, not seeking to be in charge or to have control. This is typified in the simplicity of the habit, just a plain tunic with a rope tied around it and sandals. Not flashy, not ornate. It's a habit of penance meant for serving others. Of all the spiritualities of the Church, it is probably the earthiest, focusing on the love of God through creation, living simply, welcoming the lost and outcast, and finding joy in it all. Besides St. Francis' own writings, of which I personally recommend the admonitions, you can read the works of St. Clare, St. Bonaventure, Blessed John John Scotus, and St. Bernadette of Siena, or for more modern writers, Thea Bowman, Ilya Dilio, Daniel Horan, and Richard Rohr. Next up, we look to the Jesuits, or as I like to say, Franciscans with better organizational skills. If you want a charism, be a Franciscan. If you want order in your life, be a Jesuit. The reason for this is because Ignatian spirituality, founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola, is what you get when you cross the Franciscan charism with the regiments of a military man. There are familiar elements of humility before the greater glory of God, finding God in all things, and contemplation in action, but there are also some very important innovations as well, like a succinct and codified method of discernment called the spiritual exercises. St. Ignatius compiled meditations, prayers, and contemplative practices into an organized program, usually done as a part of a 30-day retreat. Within this, a call-and-response approach is developed in which the adherent is attentive to the movement of God in the present and joins this with a decisive, active response offering both spiritual and psychological wisdom for decision-making. All of this, one can probably see, is particularly practical in thinking, something often caricatured in Jesuit jokes. As a people deeply committed to mission and the work of social justice, earthly, time-sensitive tasks, Jesuits tend to be the most adaptable and resourceful in their life and ethics. Pioneers in modern casuistry, they employ a process of treating every situation on a case-by-case -case basis rather than applying general rules to everything. Because of this, their theology can be all over the map, including people like St. Peter Claver, St. Francis Xavier, Karl Rahner, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, Avery Dulles, James Martin, and Gregory Boyle. Quite the cast of characters, if you ask me. Moving to what some might say is the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we look now to Dominicans, an order founded at the same time as the Franciscans and representing the sort of yin to our yang. If Franciscans are the heart, passionate, experiential imitators of Christ's humility, Dominicans are the head, profound, precise logicians of the mystery of God. While both are known for their preaching, the nature and concept of their mission is clearly distinct. While the Franciscans were simple preachers of repentance, going mainly to fellow Christians in the city squares, the Dominicans preached to the heretics of the Middle Ages, combating heresy with orthodoxy and wit. It's because of this that study is so important to Dominicans, possibly even its most essential feature. More monastic than Franciscans and Jesuits, Dominicans spend much of their day in either prayer or study, contemplating the Word of God first and foremost. Naturally then, Dominicans often find themselves in teaching positions, working in schools and parishes, unveiling the great truths of God. Thomas Aquinas is obviously the star thinker of the Dominicans, but they've also produced people like St. Catherine of Siena, St. Rose of Lima, Francisco de Vitoria, Edward Skillebex, and to many people's surprise, 
Gustavo Gutierrez. Plot twist! Moving now to the contemplative side of things, we look to the Benedictines, the OG of religious life in the West. Whereas the Franciscans and Dominicans may look like monks to the general public, Benedictines are in fact monks, adherents of the monastic life. For St. Benedict, this was about two things, ora et labora, work and prayer. Founded in the 6th century, this movement arose from a desire to live more intentionally for God, but for those seeking an alternative to the austerity and privacy of the lives of hermits who lived alone. Benedict believed that community was an essential aspect to spiritual growth, and that one needed a strong spiritual guide. Thus, Benedictine monasteries are at the same time places of strict order, with a regimented and stable life of contemplation under the obedience of an abbot, and centers for hospitality and shared growth. The monks live in monasteries to escape from the world, but also to provide for it, offering respite, guidance, and the fruits of their labors. Common practices for Benedictines would be the regular recitation of the Psalms at various intervals of the day, reading scripture through the process of Lexio Divina, and private meditation, all for the purpose of inclining the ear of the heart and living for God alone. And come on, when your home is also a brewery in many cases, all the more reason never to leave the house. Key figures in this spirituality are St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Peter Damien, St. Scholastica, St. Anselm, Joan Chittister, Thomas Merton, and Thomas Keating. For some people, the stability of the Benedictine spirituality is a bit too intense, but the apostolic life of the Dominicans or Franciscans isn't contemplative enough. For them, there's Carmelite spirituality. By far the most difficult to categorize, the Carmelites don't have a founder like the other orders, but developed over many years as hermits and mystics began to establish themselves on Mount Carmel, the mountain traditionally associated with Elijah. While there is indeed study for Carmelites, it's primarily a spirituality of the heart, fueled by a desire and hunger for God fulfilled by contemplative prayer. Like Benedictines, the individual cell is critically important for silence and personal prayer, developing a pure heart and stout conscience that is completely in allegiance to God. Great emphasis is placed on humility and conversion. But unlike Benedictines, their contemplation necessarily pours out with apostolic zeal, insisting that they take part in the salvation of souls through missions, preaching, and service, often beyond the grounds of the monastery. Benedictines bring the stability, Carmelites bring the fire. Famous Carmelites include St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, and St. Edith Stein. At this point, we've covered five of the most classic and most religious of the religious orders, geared towards living outside of the normal ways of the world. The last two go in the opposite direction, giving order and direction to secular lives. The first is Salesian spirituality, founded by St. Francis de Sales and St. Jane de Chantel in the 16th century. For them, there is a universal call to holiness. Monks and nuns weren't the only people who were to live saintly lives. It was the opportunity and responsibility of all Christians. To accomplish this, St. Francis emphasized the little virtues, everyday ways to live a spiritual life in ordinary situations. These virtues included things like honesty, acceptance, generosity, humility, gentle strength, kindness, patience, simplicity, liberty of spirit, interiority, joyful optimism, courage, acceptance, and stewardship. As he used to say, bloom where you're planted. A common phrase today, but one that he actually came up with. It's because of this that Salesians have traditionally been apostolic in nature, living and working outside of a cloister, easily adaptable to the needs of the world. The Sisters of St. Joseph, the Paulist Fathers, Oblates of St. Francis de Sales, the Oratorians, the Francalians, and the Salesians of John Bosco, the second largest congregation in the world, are all products of this way of life. It may not be as much of a household name as the Jesuits or Franciscans, but the Salesian spirit is alive in our world. Which brings us to our final stop in our survey of Catholic spiritualities, a movement that is well known around the world by name, even if completely misunderstood. Opus Dei. If that name sounds familiar to you but you can't remember why, it's because it appeared prominently, but not so lovingly, in the Dan Brown novel, The Da Vinci Code. Like the Salesians, Opus Dei is geared towards life in the secular world. Unlike the Salesians, and all of the examples thus far, it is not a communal-based form of life, nor do adherents take public vows, but is rather lived out almost entirely by laypeople making private commitments to a way of life. Meaning the work of God in Latin, the central focus of Opus Dei is to find God in ordinary life, collapsing any distinction there might be between an interior spiritual life and an outside ordinary life. To be truly holy, there must be a unity of life. Opus Dei is known for its commitment to regular prayer, strict fasts, and the mortification of the flesh, acts of penance meant to sanctify and bring order to the ordinary encounters of work, 
family, and society. Because of the intensity of this life, adherents are recommended to have a spiritual director and to meet regularly for meetings. You never really want to take on strict fast and mortification without a buddy. Too easy to go too far. And there you have it. Seven of the most popular spiritualities of the Catholic Church. While all of them share in the love of Christ and the desire to live a holy life, it's clear that there are many ways to go about it and that no life is a perfect fit for everyone. And that's sort of the beauty of it. It doesn't have to be. Some people are hearts, others are heads. Some are missionaries, others are more contemplative. Some want to step away from the world, others want to find a way to live more fully in it. In the church, there is something for everyone, and everyone can learn something from each of its many spiritualities.